Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Archie Marathon. Kevin and I are, um, he's in North Melbourne, I'm in Fitzroy. But today we're talking about Brisbane. We're more than 1.5 metres away. How do I touch you and cough on you? <laughs> Isolation. Oh. Uh. There's some people that, that would say that um, Brisbane may actually be the best city in Australia for architecture. I think it's oh. controversial. I think it's better than my Sydney tour, to be honest. Yeah. and all that helps to create a different type a type of spatial intent, I guess. We're different to Melbourne, but not necessarily different to Sydney. But there's obviously been – there's like a, a generation of architects that um, – uh, obviously, you know, it's been interesting for a while. Gabriel Poole just died as well. You know, yeah. Really important Brisbane or Queensland architect. But, of course, you've had um, Timothy Hill and then – all of his ex-students uh, following on from him. I think it goes well, a step before that. I think it goes back to uh, Britt Anderson and Peter O'Gorman. Yeah. I think that uh, Britt, with her sort of Scandinavian teaching, the Alvaro Alto type kind of thinking about, uh, you know, designing a seat, you know, so that it's designed for your lover. This is something you could really be passionate about and thinking about the spaces. You know, they're not interested so much on the envelope, but it's actually the um, the quality of the spaces, and they're really thinking about each space. And I think that's very different, and I think it needs to be experienced. And I find a lot of the Brisbane work very hard to photograph. But maybe that's why people don't understand it. It's the type of architecture that you have to visit, you have to be in. Um, and once you do, it's kind of, I think with many of it, the spaces, it's almost like a primal response. Types yeah. of spaces where you just know this has been really well considered to bring in the light, the breeze. It's really nice to sit with people in a really appropriate scale. And I think that's very different from anywhere I've been to. You know, um, Timothy Hill, you mentioned, uh, Timothy and um, Brian Donovan, who started Donovan Hill in um, the late 90s. They were students of Britt and uh, Peter Gorman as well. Mm. Also, but, and, and each of those architects has had a real really strong commitment to education as well. And I also wonder whether that's where some of the nuance and the stuff comes from with Brisbane's architecture is you've had people at the top of their game that were probably too busy to teach but still committed significant time to provide quality uh, architectural education in, in the fundamentals. Um, you know, maybe that doesn't happen in some other places. Leave your comments and tell me how much of a dickhead I am. But I think there's some, you know, serious talent. Britt Anderson, yep, um, and definitely Timothy Hill, generous people with their time to uh, to educate a whole new generation. Did you read the article that David Neustein wrote? No, no. I was waiting. I was hoping you'd just tell me the the well, abridged version. One of the interesting story, and I think he, he talks about the around the late 90s, early 2000s, the, the sort of two iconic houses from Queensland, one from Britt Anderson, Peter O'Gorman, the one in Sherbrooke Island, which really celebrate this inside-outside um, quality and the crafting as well. Whereas uh, Timothy Hill and Brian Donovan, they had uh, the Sea House, yeah. uh, which is uh, phenomenal. It's, it's, you know, call it the 
little Italian hill town. But the, the story was that the, the client um, that, well, they, he grew up with houses that always had um, additions that's added and change and through over time. He said, no, I want a house. I'm going to spend all the money that eventually I'm going to have to upgrade the house now up front. So design a house that will last. Design a house that will cater for all changes. You know, he wasn't married at that time. You know, he said, just design it as if we're going to have families, it's going to have generations living there. What is it going to be like? So they really started to explore the subtleties of a lot of spaces and how different occasions and how they can be used with you know, almost a sense of like without really knowing what it could be. So it could be anyone and everyone, really. And I think that experiment also leads to a lot of understanding of public spaces because that's what you're designing for, right? In public spaces, you think about all scenarios. And I think that mm -hmm. leads to public programs that they really start to do that. And I think Brisbane does public spaces really well when they yeah. do it. Yeah, which I think some people would say, oh, it's because of climate you could do it. But I think it's so much more than that. I think there's, there's just a, a very careful understanding of the human animal and how they relate with each other and relate, relate with the climate and their environment and the spaces. Uh, and it takes a very skilled hand to execute that. Robin Gibson's uh, work in the late 70s, early 80s, the large public buildings, civic buildings, but the gallery, uh, you've got the performance centre, performance arts centre, and the library, amongst other buildings, and Science Museum, I think, is, is there as well. Yeah, that gallery, well, I, I lived in Brisbane for a, a, a very short time as a child, um, and uh, I do... People have asked me in the past, when did you decide to be an architect? And well, I think one of the contributing factors was actually the um, the art gallery. That was the first time sitting there next to that in, internal pond with a little bench there where I, I first realised, um, you know, it was a remarkable space. And I'd really come to the, uh, notice that somebody had thought about this. You know, this, these spaces don't just happen. Somebody's had to rigorously think about um, somebody experiencing what I was experiencing in that moment. And it made me sort of quite interested in the fact that um, we can really um, affect people emotionally um, uh, with space. And that, that got me thinking about architecture, as, you know, which I didn't even know existed. You know, I had to sort of hunt it out. Who, who are these people that think about spaces beyond just, you know, a roof and four walls? The library project that Donovan Hill did, uh, which was on the old introverted brutalist library, um, and they basically turned it inside out. They made all the rooms and things connect to the river, which they never did. And mm. and also the, a lot of the details and spaces and rooms, they feel like they it even got details that, that were used in their houses. Yeah, so, and they always have. You know, even in their biggest projects, which I, I think is great to have that that um, pedigree. And Robin Gibson's project, I mean, on the outside, it's it's pretty brutal. Um, mm. It's it's very introverted. Yep. It has its presence. I mean, you know, back then, obviously, that site was quite uh, separate from the rest of the city. Yeah. So it had to kind of scream in its own kind of massive kind of language, but. Now it's a lot of projects have been added around there. There's Boma um, Gallery of Modern Art, mm -hmm. Actus, uh, and the Claire's Claire Design, and then you've got the, the the site south of that, which was the 1988 Expo site, which had uh, and then had the uh, sort of the fake beach there. Um, Still there, yeah, yeah. yeah the, it's actually surprisingly, I know it's a it's known as the Kitty Wing Pond. But it is actually quite surprising and quite utilised space. And oh, I, I think it's very successful. I once had a New Year's Eve there, which was terrifying. Speaking of, <laughs> oh, you know, they, they weren't kids pissing in the pool, um, but all the fireworks going off. But, I, you know, I spent time in that pool. I think it's um, actually a pretty great public space. So I lived there from grade two to grade six. So I was a little kid and... Um, and I and and where I lived, 
uh, pretty modest houses, lots of Queenslanders, obviously. So there's the Queensland pedigree. Um, and then, uh, but no fences. It was bloody brilliant. I can remember that me and my mates didn't really understand this idea of, of, of truly understand boundaries because all of our backyards just blurred into each other. All of our front yards blurred into each other. And you just play you know, through all of these spaces and there'd be like hedges and things like that, which didn't stop us. Um, and then, you know, I'm originally from Tassie where, you know, grew up on a farm um but then coming to melbourne we're far out everything's about privacy and overlooking and these really high fences um so what's special about brisbane to me is um yeah it's the residential spaces like in the suburban spaces um so many um of the suburban areas and it's, you know which in terms of somewhere like melbourne the suburbs are really far away there's a lot of really great inner suburban areas um and the residential spaces are really quite you know special and the good thing about the residential architecture there, and you hear people like um, what was then um, Owen and Vokes and now Vokes Peters, uh, is they talked about, you know, you hear them give lectures about their work and they say they're custodians of well-worn ideas, that they're not trying to invent anything new. They're trying, they're, there's this incredible um, heritage, uh, uh, vocabulary of, of creating really great um residential spaces and they want to borrow from those uh, where appropriate and that's sort of their skill set is knowing when to use these well-worn ideas and I, I, I remember hearing that and just thinking that's actually kind of generous as, and, and putting your ego in check as an architect to know that you're a custodian of these really fantastic ideas and your job is to use them appropriately. You talked about the, the boundary that's quite interesting because uh, I think we had this conversation before that uh, the spaces they're more interested in space or place making or defining a space and the quality of that space less so about the envelope or the or the boundary that makes that space mm, mm. i think there's something about that climate about the no fencing that's about here and then the spaces around it and what makes this a special thing versus that over there rather than having to physically define it with with walls and what have you, and the climate allows for that to, to happen, but there's also a lot more, therefore maybe a lot more spatial awareness and the quality of the spaces and how they're defined in a sort of subtropical environment. Mm, mm. And yeah. another thing as well, it, it's actually very hard to photograph the buildings, as I said, uh, and it's some of the buildings, like the TRI, uh, yep. the Translational Research Institute by Donovan Hill, uh, which is now um, part of BVN Donovan Hill and Wilson Architects. That, you know, it's a research institute. It's got four major kind of uh, uh, institutions together in, in one building. But the thing is, the main space, which is actually the courtyard, the sort of beautiful jungle pretty much in the middle of it, mm. is open 24 hours. You can go there and it's just yep. amazing. Why, I mean, it's typical hospital research kind of type building. Apology, but is able to turn that courtyard into an amazing public space. Yeah, generous space, which you know, of course, the um, the people using the building also love the fact that there is this sort of civic shared um, community space, um, and and similar to the library, where you get this great sort of almost domesticity about that space, and the same types of details that you saw in Donovan's, you know, Donovan Hills residential work translating into that and the use of timber and bricks these very domestic um, uh, materials used where that public space is and yet the rest of the building is actually you know very commercial um, it's in nature quite up against other buildings so it's very hard to get an overview there's no heroic kind of external shots i'm sure there yeah. are some can, but you never see it that way mm. even the way you it is kind of through between buildings and then you arrive at this it's like the internal space is the heroic kind of facade rather than the outside. So the good thing about Archie Marathon is that we get to visit uh, through contacts on social media and people we meet and friends uh, can get to visit some pretty amazing private houses or places that you usually can't get access to. The D house is amazing because it's actually, I think is the one of the lowest budget projects they've ever done. It's very small, but it's a typology in itself. It is 
you know, in some ways it's quite defensive from the street, but their main living space is that big timber slider. They can slide it right away and their living space can just look out on the street and they can have conversations with people. They can let people look in. But then if they want privacy, this huge timber slider comes back and cuts it off. So it's a really beautiful example. Again, it's about the subtlety that you see in so much work in Brisbane of not having either or. It's both and, you know. And that goes choose. that story about the origin story of just various iterations or various, uh, not iterations, various uh, configurations. No, it's not even configurations. Various just possibilities. Possibilities. Just yeah, that it doesn't – that you give something a longer lifespan if you allow it to have different personalities, you know, over time. Um, if you design it too tightly one way, well, guess what? You'll quickly find that it's redundant because life changes. So if life changes, your buildings need to be able to be malleable to allow that change to happen. Being there in the 80s, you know, you definitely felt that kind of – that L.A. – thing maybe even a little bit of las vegas thing going on and um you do wonder whether there was a, a bit of sort of looking across the pond and and thinking it's a similar climate and it's pretty cool culture borrowing some of those ideas um but again it's a very brisbane thing of like there's familiarity about it like it's you know it, it's not um trying to be um any you know anything other than just brisbane borrowing similar languages and materials and doing it so beautifully Places like Brisbane and, and Sydney, you know, there's these buildings that have got their hero shots and you can go around and visit them and, and get it if you're a lay person, if you're a non-architect. Um, but in terms of Brisbane, it really does feel like a, a, the city that you need to be guided through, either by a local or something like Archie Marathon. You need to actually, you know, be shown um, – where the quality spaces are, and maybe even it's told why the spaces work so well. Yeah, because I think you, you might just walk past it and, and not uh, bat an eyelid. Yeah, not realise how thoughtful some of this stuff is. Again, going back to that epiphany I had when I was a child at the uh, art gallery, you know, kind of not realising because something feels so comfortable and humanist that it was actually crafted that way. You kind of, in in, in a way... You, you assume because it felt so inevitable it was. Well, I'm sorry. A lot of architects bled over, the, the, you know, thinking about these spaces to craft them in that way. Let's wrap. <laughs> Go, Kevin. We're going to wrap. Wiki, wiki, wah. My name is Kevin, and I feel like heaven because I'm... Do not put this part in it. Oh, my God. I regret everything. Who gave me beer? Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Uh, uh, tell us in the comments what you think about Brisbane's architecture. And tell me why I'm wrong. It's the best city in Australia for architecture. Many lessons to learn. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, please. Um, we love you all. And uh, thanks for watching. And let us know what you want to see in the next, uh, what's the, you know, what's a good one to do for the next episode, considering we're all stuck inside going insane. I'm okay.